Hello and welcome to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. Now, I hope everyone is surviving this polar vortex that is going across the United States. And if you're listening to this in the summer, you have no idea what the hell I'm talking about. But it's cold. It's a blast of cold air that is going across the United States. It's not really too cold here in Raleigh. It's pretty normal for us. But I'm happy to report that when this podcast is released in February, the first week in February, I'll be in Florida. So it's even going to be warmer for me there than in Raleigh, but really not to rub it in at all for those of you that are in Wisconsin and Nebraska and the really cold states. But anyway, so I always like to tell you where guests come from on this podcast. Uh, One day, someone sent me the Art of Health Promotion, which is like a part of the American Journal of Health Promotion. And there was an article about new measures for new directions. So it was a really fascinating article. And I'm actually, you know, some of the stuff that the two co-editors, Sarah Johnson and Jessica Grossmeyer, are putting out in this Art of Health Promotion, it's just kind of a little bit new for uh, that side of the camp, if you will. Sometimes it tends to be very old school. But Jessica and Sarah are giving it, I think, in my opinion, new life. But anyway, this article that I read was about, there was several different articles in there. So this article that I'm referring to, a piece of it was about Stanford researchers and how they set out to identify a comprehensive conceptualization of well-being constructed from the experiences and perspectives of a diverse set of people. Today's guests are two of the researchers, Sandy Winters and Julia Gustafson. And let me tell you a little bit more about them. Sandy Winter is a director of the Welfare Life Research Initiative and a social science research scholar at the Stanford Prevention Research Center. The goal of WELL is to build scientific evidence base about well-being using observational, interventional, and biosampling approaches conducted on a global scale. So you'll notice an accent as Sandy is from Zimbabwe. She moved to Kentucky in 2006, which I imagine was a culture shock. And she's been at the SPRC at Stanford since 2009. Now, Julia Gustafson works as the Director of Community Engagement for Stanford Well for Life, where she strives to empower local communities and organizations to adopt and promote a culture of holistic well-being. Julia is a population health enthusiast to the core, and she believes in the power of communities. In her professional life, Julia has worked on many community-wide initiatives, including championing and creating partnerships with the Minnesota DNR, regional and local parks to create the first Parks Rx in Minnesota, which recently received a 2018 Minnesota State Government Innovation Award. A believer that health isn't a privilege, Julia assisted in creating a behavioral economics intervention model for food shelves known as Super Shelf. You know, as I'm reading this by, I'm I'm really interested in what that's all about, but we didn't get into that at all. Uh, I'll link it all up in the show notes. If you want to go peruse what Super Shelf is, you can go for it. Now, in today's interview, Sandy and Julia tell us all about their roles, what got them interested in trying to conceptualize well-being, and what they found in their research. One aspect I love about their creation is that the individual gets to prioritize what's important to them. Hmm, imagine that, right? Typically, like in my days of the health assessments, you know, you go through and you you fill a big, long survey out, and there may be some stages of change questions on there, but ultimately, it printed out a big old long report that says, here's all the things you need to work on. And they'll also, Cindy and Julia will also tell us how you can actually use this instrument at no charge. Now, before we dive into the interview, if you are listening to this live in the polar vortex, (laughs) then there's one more week before our next generation wellness training starts. You know, one person did reach out to me after my small group training. So I had three wellness professionals from my small group training who will be at Next Generation Wellness. They were, she listened to the podcast and she said, hey, I'd love to join the training. I just don't have as much experience as those people who were on your podcast. And I said, hey, no worries. You don't have to have a 10 tons of experience. If anything, if you're just in there to learn and share and ask questions and be curious, that's what we're looking for. Sometimes I think that a lot of us have so much experience and so much expertise, if you will, that is we get the curse of the knowledge, right? We think we know everything. So starting next Wednesday, we're going to cover how to clearly and confidently move into this next generation of wellness. 
And so each week we're going to give you, of course, the theory part, right? Here's all the research. Here's some things to consider. But then we're going to break it down into practical application. Like what exactly, if we had to apply this theory, what would that look like in practice? What's the very first step? What is one thing I can do with a client? What's one thing I can do with my organization? And the other cool thing is we're going to have case studies. So some are going to be live where people are going to show up and you'll be able to ask them a bunch of questions. And then some are recorded, but got a slew of wellness professionals that will tell you how they've moved from biomedical approach to an integrated one, how they are fighting um, kind of this paradigm of weight uh, and BMI, um, how people have used their own resilient skills to continue to put in this next generation of wellness, how a uh, wellness pro- professional kind of ditched all the incentives. So some really good stuff. Now, although... Our class starts in a week, if you're listening to this live. We may close registration early. We've had the extreme fortune to have 27 people register for our training, which means we need to cap it. We never thought we'd have this problem. So we're only going to allow 30 people total in the training, just because we want the group to have a really good experience, feel comfortable having conversations and discussion. That's what it's all about. And so if you have been on the fence and you're not quite sure it's time to make a decision. If you want to join us, then you can just go to redesigningwellness.com and there is information on the training, but then there's also a purchase button if you want to go ahead and dive into the training. Otherwise, you may miss out on this training that starts on February 13th. So just wanted to give you a heads up that registration is open until there's three slots filled, which may or may not be until February 12th. All right. Now, without further ado, I hope you enjoy this interview with Sandy Winter and Julia Gustafson. As always, thank you so much for listening to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. Hello and welcome to Redesigning Wellness, your go-to podcast for making the most of your corporate health strategies. Your host is Jen Arnold, Corporate Wellness Consultant. With over a decade of experience in promoting worksite health, she'll help boost your wellness program to one your employees are sure to enjoy. And now, here's Jen. Sandy and Julia, welcome to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. I'm so glad to have you both on. Thank you for yeah, inviting thank us. Thank you for having us. It's always fun to have two people on. So we're going to, at least you have a very, you know, one has a very distinct accent. So we can tell you both apart without seeing you visually. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Yes. I'm, I'm from Africa originally. Oh, Africa. I did not know that. Mm-hmm. What part of Africa? I was born in Zimbabwe, but I spent many years in Cape Town. Wow. So how long have you been in the States? I've been in the States since 2003, uh, and I was in Kentucky for the first five years, and then I've spent the last 10 years in California. Well, Kentucky must have been quite a culture shock. (laughs) It was. Very pretty there. (laughs) Especially if you're a horse. I think the horses get um, preferential treatment sometimes. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, it is a very pretty state. I can imagine that would have been very different. (laughs) Well, what, what did you guys uh, start off by telling us a little bit about the work you both do at Stanford? Yes, so I've been at Stanford for about 10 years, and I've had a number of different positions here. But the position that I currently have is as director of the Well for Life Initiative. And I'll stop there. Yeah, I've been at, this is Julia speaking, I've been at Stanford now for just a little over a year. So I'm uh, fairly new compared to Sandy, but I'm the Director of Community Engagement for the Well for Life Initiative, and I guess when you think of research, you don't always think about having a community engagement component about it, but historically speaking, research doesn't always have the greatest reputation, and in the past, they've exploited some communities and vulnerable populations, leaving a lot of mistrust, so essentially my job is to make sure that moving forward, we don't do the same thing. I work on building partnerships with local and national community organizations um, and engage them in the work that we're doing. So not only are they being represented in our work, but they also have a voice in the direction of our initiative. Yeah, that is a really unique position. So can you guys give us the the big overview of Well for Life and, and what it does? Yes. So Well for Life was established about four years ago, and our goal is to 
try and understand well-being a little bit better. So the work that we do is at part of the Stanford Prevention Research Center, which is part of Stanford University School of Medicine. And we have a 50-year history of doing chronic disease prevention and health promotion work. And we have many investigators here who investigate different things. So, for example, physical activity, nutrition, tobacco cessation. And they also do this work across different population groups. So some of our investigators are interested in work site programs. Some of them are interested in family-based interventions or interventions for older adults, different ethnic groups. Um, And so we have this very um, broad way of looking at problems uh, from all of these different perspectives. Uh, And for years, we've been doing this chronic disease and, and prevention and health promotion work, but we feel like we're not really moving the needle anymore. People, generally speaking, know that they should be eating more healthfully, know that they should be more physically active, but somehow they just aren't doing that anymore. And so we're trying to think about a way of encouraging people to make and maintain healthy behaviors in a new and different way. And one of the ways that we're thinking about doing that is that instead of telling people, look, be healthy now so that you avoid health, heart disease or, or chronic diseases in 20 years time, the idea is can we in the moment um, help people to to engage with their feelings of vitality and thriving and and having a sense of purpose and meaning? And could that maybe make help people to to make behavior changes in the short term rather than thinking about these long term health consequences? Right. And you're like many of us, right? That just feel like we're beating our head against the wall. Like the message is not resonating and people, people pretty much <laughs> know, right? And it's so funny how something that sounds so like yeah, like, of course we should focus on the moment. Like none of us have been doing that, right? We've been talking about the 20 years in the future or 50 years in the future, something very far off. You know, I like the way that you're going. Anything to add to that, Julia? Um, I think, um, like Sandy said, there's not one person in the United States that doesn't know they should be getting exercise or eating their vegetables. And yet the, the needle is still going up on chronic disease. And so I think we're just working on shifting that narrative from one that's obsessed with preventing chronic disease to one that's uh, focused on thriving and fostering well-being in the moment to kind of shift the way that we think about health and how it's experienced. Mm -hmm. And so is that what sparked the idea to conceptualize well-being and, and looked into, like, is that what started the research that you did? Yes. Yeah. And I think Well for Life is very unique in that, like Sandy said also, we have nine different faculty collaborating on this project with expert expertise in um, multiple different areas. And so for them to all put their brains together to focus on this concept of holistic well-being as opposed to it naturally being so siloed uh, makes the work we're doing very unique. Mm-hmm. And, and so how did you go about it? So once you had this idea and said, we're going to go put, put, I guess, a definition around well-being, what does it mean? What were, what were your first steps? So actually, we didn't at all come up with a definition of well-being. Um, when we looked at the current models of well-being, it seemed that they were primarily driven by experts, so people who sat around the table and said, well, we think this is what well-being is, and so this is how we're going to measure it. Or alternatively, they were based on some theory of psychological theory or behavior theory, something like that. But we didn't really find any measures of well-being that actually asked people about what they thought well-being was all about. So we adopted a grounded narrative approach, which means that we went around and asked different people to tell us stories about times of high well-being and times of low well-being without defining for the person what well-being meant. And the people that we asked, we tried to get as diverse a sample as possible. So we have people across different ethnic groups, different age groups, different income groups. Um, And then that was very purposely chosen. And then sort of by happenstance, we also had people who were from different ends of the health continuum. So some people who were super fit and strong physically and other people who had terminal diseases. And we asked all of these people to describe times of high and low well-being. 
And we got hundreds of hours of interviews that we then spent about a year and a half going through and trying to extract the main themes or domains that people spoke about when they were talking about well-being. And so from that, we've extracted 10 main domains of well-being. And then we went back back to the literature. So now we knew what people were talking about. Then we went back into the literature and we tried to find the best questions that actually measured what people were talking about. And we have created a survey, the Stanford Well for Life Scale, which comprises 76 questions that ask about those particular components of well-being. Um, and then in addition, we also ask some additional questions like um, demographics or health status, because that could also affect people's um, sense of well-being. Okay, you lost me a little bit on that. So you said that you picked the best questions that measured what people were talking about. Yes. Explain that to me. I, don't, I didn't quite follow. So, um, for example, with social connectedness, people often think that social connectedness is a positive attribute and it helps people in terms of their health and well-being. But when we were asking people the questions, we actually found that about 43% of the time when they were talking about well-being and social connectedness, they were talking about social connectedness as a negative factor, so something that detracted from their well-being. And it could be things like being in an unhealthy relationship or also things like not being able to meet the expectations that people have of you or being burdened by being a caregiver. And so our measure of well-being has both positive and negative attributes to it. So it's not all about feeling like you're thriving and, and vital, but what are the things that also detract from your well-being? So we, we try to, to measure both the positive and the negative aspects. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting because, yeah, everyone, like you said, you do always think of it in the positive sense, right? You never think about all those energy vampires out there. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And so things like physical health, when we were... T- talking to our the people that we interviewed, when they were talking about their health, it was less about their disease status and more about whether or not they had the energy and the vitality to do the things that they wanted to do in a day. So, for example, we had one participant who did an hour-long interview about her well-being and never mentioned the fact that Immediately after that interview, she was going to get chemotherapy because she had terminal cancer. But she never mentioned that as being a detractor to her well-being. And yet we had other people, young, strong athletes, who were in the physical prime of their lives, who had reported very low levels of well-being. So, you know, didn't know didn't have a good sense of self, were trying to figure out what their future held, insecure about where they were in life. Um, and so this idea that your physical health, it may not necessarily be associated with your well-being in the same direction that people would normally think. So just because you're physically healthy doesn't mean to say that you have a high level of well-being. And just because you're terminally ill doesn't mean to say that you have a low level of well-being. And so those are some of the things that we're trying to explore in this study. Right. And so I'm looking at this model. So you have 10 dom- domains of well-being, and I'm looking at the model, which no one who's listening can see right now. And it looks like social connectedness is a large domain versus creativity, which is smaller. So were there, I guess, I don't know if there's mm-hmm. bigger contributors or more people talked about social connectedness than creativity? Like how are all the domains maybe related and kind of how much right. do they contribute to overall well-being? Each of these domains are um, interrelated to each other, but the size of the pedal that you're referring to mm. talks about uh, or shows how many times people talked about them during the interviews. So the larger the pedal, the more it was talked about. And like Sandy mentioned earlier, that could be positive and it could be negative. Many times when you talk about social connectedness, it's positive, but it can also be negative. And so that's what the size of the the pedal is referring to in that. But actually in our um, in the Stanford Well for Life scale, we have not weighted any of the domains because what could be 
well-being is very pluralistic, right? So what drives my well-being is different than what drives your well-being. And so we didn't want to make that assumption for anybody. And so our scale is not weighted, but instead it's we we align it with somebody's values. Um, and that's what uh, the results you get at the end are. You, re- you receive your results in each of the domains, and then it's overlaid with how you valued each of those domains. So, yeah. Julia, maybe you want to just describe, you know, list out the domains so that it can be in the recording? Yes, that would be helpful. Yeah. The top 10 things that came out of those interviews with people when they told their stories about times of high well-being and times of low well-being were social connectedness, um, the lifestyle and daily practices, which is what you typically think of when people talk about well-being. Those are things like your diet, your physical activity, if you smoke, alcohol use, and then, of course, sleep. Um, the next domain is stress and resilience and mental and emotional health, um, purpose and meaning in life, your physical health, sense of self, finances, spirituality and religiosity, and then exploration and creativity. So how are physical and lifestyle different? So lifestyle and daily practices are, are things that you do in your life to, that can influence how healthy you are, right? But your physical health could be how much energy you have. And like I said earlier, the domains are definitely interconnected, but physical health is more directly related to um, whether or not you have that disease or if you feel a sense of vitality and energy where lifestyle and daily practices are more of the things you do to achieve that, if that makes sense. And Sandy, if if you wanted to elaborate more on that. No, I think you described that well. The other interesting part, yeah, it it was clear. Thank you for that. Um, The other interesting dimension is emotional and mental health. I know that they are kind of all combined, but some people separate the mental, emotional, and then mental. Any thoughts on that or anything that came up in the interviews on why it was those two components were combined? No, I would say that, again, you know, there are both positive and negative attributes. And a lot of the existing quality of life or well-being measures Really, they're talking about decrements to well-being, things that, so for how many days have you lacked energy or how many days have you not been able to do the tasks that you want to do? Um, and so we have both positive and negative questions um, scattered throughout and also particularly in that mental and emotional health component. Mm-hmm. So I guess there's just the, the way that the interviews came out, it just made more sense. Everything kind of came as a trend to bucket those two together. Yeah. Uh, so whenever you were interviewing people, did anything come up about the workplace or anything about jobs or did those just kind of go into mm-hmm. like creativity or, you know, uh, purpose? Did that come up at all? So people's work did come up a lot, but it seemed that it was a second step to these 10 domains. So for example, um, people talked about finances in relation to their job, but it seemed to be the finances that was actually driving their well-being. And the same with respect to social connectedness. So they may have mentioned work in the same um, conversation when they were talking about social connectedness, but we were trying to extract what we felt were the actual drivers, so the primary things. um, And then these may impact other things, so family or work or technology use or commuting or anything like that. But the ten, those 10 domains seem to be the primary drivers of what people thought they impacted their well-being. Got it. That makes sense. I will add, there are questions about the built environment in our survey as well. So not only do we ask about their disease status, because we know that influences their well-being, but we also ask questions about the context in which they're living. And so jobs and careers would be part of that as well. So again, like Sandy said, it's something that it does influence it, but these 10 domains are really the drivers of that, or the other stuff is more of the the context. Mm -hmm. And I I think, you know, for a researcher, we could go on asking questions forever. I mean, people on our website, they 
say things like, well, you didn't ask me about my pet ownership and my dog is the main thing that drives my well-being or my commute or my use of technology or all of these things. Um, as a researcher, there's only so much we can ask a person at any one time. And even as it is, our mm -hmm. survey takes about half an hour to complete. So it's not to say that these other things aren't important. It's just that we were trying to focus on the, the things that were seem to be most important that are probably unlikely to to change in terms of the domains over time. But you said the survey takes how long? To take? About 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Yeah, that's the most time you're going to get from anyone, if you've done even that. And, you know, I, I would say having a pet would be social connectedness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can yeah. go in any of those domains, yes. Well, yeah, I can imagine. Um, you don't want people sitting there taking a survey for hours, 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Sufficient. So, okay, so you took all of this this data and you put it into the Stanford Well for Life scale. Like, w was that the purpose w whenever like, you went out to do the research was to build the scale or were you just doing the research and then said, okay, we, we're going to build something out of it? Well, no, primarily at the Prevention Research Center at Stanford, we are interventionists. We don't do research just for the sake of doing the research. We want to be able to intervene to improve people's health and well-being. And so one of the ways that when you do an intervention, you want to be able to measure to see whether or not your intervention actually worked. And so the very first thing was for us to develop a measure of well-being that we thought would um, capture this very complex subjective topic um, and that also we we hope will be sensitive to change over time so that as we follow our cohort of people in over the next few years, um, we'll be able to tell what kinds of things impact people's well-being. And then our ultimate goal is to try and do interventions to improve health and well-being. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so you're actually following this cohort for years is that what you said for how, how many years or just uh, so that's our goal um we're in our so we started in 2014 so the study is four years old and our intention is to follow this group of people um for, into the future and our goal is also to recruit 10,000 people per site so right now we have about I would say almost 4,000 people here in the Bay Area. But then we also have sites in China, Taiwan, and Singapore. And we are developing a new site in Thailand as well. And so our goal would be to have 10,000 people at each site. And I think altogether we have about 17 or 18,000 people who have completed that Stanford Well for Life scale um, in all of these different sites. So 17 or 18,000 have taken the taken the. Yes, and so that'll enable us to look for cross-cultural differences in well-being. So it's used now. How okay? So you just told me a few ways that it's used now. Is it is it used in the worksite at all, or like specifically for worksite, or is it kind of just general general population using it? Julia, why don't you ask that question? Yeah, that's a that's a really great question, and that goes that's uh, directly related to my job. So. Uh, when we start forming partnerships with different organizations or community groups or the local government, it's not only so they can recruit participants for us. That's not the way we like to operate. It's a symbiotic relationship, right? So they're interested in partnering with Well for Life for many reasons, and a lot of that is because of the data they can receive afterwards. So anyways, there's there's many reasons why organizations are interested in partnering with Well for Life, whether it's to simply spread the word that they um, are aligned with creating a culture of well-being. But um, most of the time, they're interested in the data that they can receive back on their community or the people that they're serving. So for instance, we've partnered with 11 YMCAs that comprise the Y of Silicon Valley. And they're really interested in this from a perspective of getting information on the well-being needs of their, their members so they can help tailor their programming. So if they saw that the mental and emotional health domain their members were scoring really low on, they could create different initiatives or offer different programs um, that are proven to increase the mental and emotional health of their members. So things like that. We've partnered with different community uh, organizations to help change some policies around certain areas. So, for example, we work with people with disabilities, and they want this data because it's a very 
underrepresented community and there's not a lot of voice that's been given to them. So we're working together to get them some data that they can bring to help change policies around the care that they're receiving through the county. So it can be used in a, a multitude of different ways. Um, a lot of organizations are also interested in the data for grant purposes. And so they can use the data to help apply for grants and show their needs for funding. Yeah, I think that's how we've been doing it so far. So so let's take that example. It's kind of similar to what I'm assuming an employer would use it, like the YMCA would use it. So let's just say in an organization, because most of my listeners are going to be working uh, with or for an organization, they would all their employees would take the uh, welfare life scale. They would get an individual report and then the employer would get an aggregate report. Correct. Yeah. So that's part of the community partner program. So initially when we formed this partnership, uh, everyone who they have take it from their community gets their individualized reports. And then once at least 50 people, because that's the minimum it takes uh, for us to be able to successfully de-identify that information, we give them an aggregated report back. And so they can use that information for however they would like to, to use it. And so there's a lot of interest from employee well-being programs. That's what we've um, partnered with some other organizations to do uh, so they can create programming for their, their employees to increase their well-being. We actually partner with Stanford's Be Well program, which is the employee well-being program that Stanford uses across the university. And our Well for Life scale is one of the incentives. So if they complete it, they receive an incentive um, from Stanford for doing that. Got it. And does it cost? Is there a cost per person for employees to take it? No, it's free. No, it's free. <laughs> mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. Yeah. If um if any of your listeners or if anybody did want to um have a group report that Julia is describing, we need to set up a group identifier so that when people are logging in, they would know to check that they're part of that group, and then that's the way we can pull that data to make an aggregated report. But the it's it's a free service that we provide. Got it. Well, I have to link up in the show notes how they can get in contact with you. Because even I'm thinking about for a client, I'm like, oh, I should like to test this. Is it possible for my listeners to test it to say, like, to go through as an individual so they could see what they would an employee would experience? Yeah, absolutely. And that's what we recommend actually. Before we start a full on partnership, we recommend that um, the people who are interested join well for life themselves, make sure they see it's a benefit to the individual as well as what their organizational needs are. And so that too is also free. Um, They can just log on to our website and join well for life there. It's it's an online based uh, program. We we have their individual portal that they can log into and have access for that for their whole life. So So the only eligibility criteria that they're over 18 and that they live in the U.S. Um, currently the survey is available in English, Spanish, and Chinese. Oh, wow. Yeah, I was about to say, it could actually, for, for, I know that there's some folks that work globally, right? So they've got U.S. population and then across, um, just thinking, uh, would you ever take those folks to get some more global data? Or are you really just trying to concentrate on U.S. only, as you just said? (laughs) I think it's just a question of resources and timing. Our goal would be to understand well-being in a global context, but we are quite a small team and uh, we're already spread fairly thin. So as the program grows and we receive more funding and we get more staff, we're very interested in expanding to different population groups. Got it. Got it. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I'd love to get that information oh. and um, take it myself. Yeah. yeah. There's one thing I would like to add regarding a benefit for Um, different organizations if they'd like to use this for an employee health program. And the fact that it's a longitudinal study is great because if they did implement any programs that they wanted to see if it made a difference on, like Sandy said, this is used to measure intervention. So if they did an intervention and would like to see if it was successful or not, and they would be able to do that because the next year when we went through and collected the data again, hopefully we'd be able to see increases in scores in the areas of focus. Okay. So 
then the idea would be that you take it annually. Is that what I just heard? Yep. Okay. And then you would hope that, because this is one of my questions, what do you recommend that wellness practitioners do with the results? So then the idea is they get back the aggregate results and they're going, our, our folks are really um, struggling in social connectedness. So therefore we're going to, to try some interventions there, but the hope that obviously it comes out better the next year. Is that on target or is, are there some other recommendations there? Did I, did I do that too simple? Yeah. No, no, not at all. It's, it's a simple concept, right? It's a, it's a needs assessment. So if you, if you think about the, the partner report that we give back, it's a, it's a holistic needs assessment for their employees or their community of people. And so depending on what that organization values and wants to focus on, and maybe that is social connectedness. And for example, if they scored low in that area, that's an opportunity for them to do some interventions to increase the social connectedness of their employees or their, their community that they're serving. So when individuals get their report back, do, do, are there recommendations for what they can do to increase their well-being in the area that they value and that they may be lower in? Yeah. So when individuals get their results back, like we were talking about earlier, if I always like to give this example. You get an overall well-being score, but it could be that it's 65 out of 100, and that might seem very low. But then make sure you look at whether or not you valued those domains that were lower. We had a participant email us, and she said, if I'm a poor atheist. Does that mean I will never have high levels of well-being? <laughs> and that's just simply not the case. If you don't value it, it's not going to mean a lot if you put a ton of energy into that area to increase those scores. But whether we'd like you to, like if you scored low on lifestyle and daily practices, but you valued it very high, that would be your opportunity to increase your well-being score there. So you'd get the most bang for your buck because you value it and there's opportunity for improvement. So let me just say that that is so reassuring and welcoming. I love that part of it because how often do we run people through assessment? And we just tell them how bad they are. <laughs> like they're like, well, I don't care anyway. Like, I, don't, I don't want to improve anyway. Yeah, leave me the hell alone. So this is nice. Yeah, and, it, and exactly. And it goes back to um, what we were talking about earlier. You think people who have these chronic uh, diseases are do not have high levels of well-being, but that disease might not even factor into how they perceive their well-being. So certain domains might not really even factor into how you perceive your own do- uh, well-being. So it's very uh, individualized, and that's what we aim to address when we provide feedback to the individual. And then from there, it's up to them to decide how they want to move forward with that information. And we provide resources, and we have challenges that they can join for free to that we put out that address each of the domains of well-being. I think it would be great, Julia, for you to describe the challenges a little bit more. Yeah. So currently we have a mindfulness challenge going on and there are seven day challenges where people can join. And then we in-house, we come up with this challenge that's vetted by experts in that content area. And then we provide people that that challenge and it's something that they can do on their own or in a group setting depending on how they want to go about it but then they also um, have access then to that community of people who have also joined the challenge so our challenge has been running for about a week now and we have over 200 people who've, who've joined it and those 200 people are now in a community talking to each other about what's worked for them what hasn't worked for them what they've tried from the mindfulness practices and we let that run for about a month. And then we come out with our new challenge. We've had them on social connectedness. We've had no sugar added. We've had move more, sit less. We've had a mind, body, spirit challenge, finances. We really try to address all the different domains and come up with fun and creative ways to do that. So we don't try to address big lifestyle changes. We don't tell people to go to the gym for 45 minutes every day of the week. We try to encourage people to do small behavior changes in their daily life that um, seem accessible and approachable. So hopefully after the week's done, 
they have had a really good experience and think, hey, maybe because I was able to do it this week, I can carry it on to the next week and the next week after that. That sounds really cool. Well, you know, before we, you know, end with the contact information and links to everything to make sure people can access you, is there anything I didn't ask you that you want to make sure my listeners know about the Stanford Well for Life scale? I just the take home note about Well for Life in general is that we're moving away from thinking about well being as the absence of chronic disease, but rather it's a a state of thriving and being well in that moment. And for practitioners, when they move forward to talk about well-being with clients, we hope that they address it as something that's holistic as opposed to a siloed approach for people. Yeah, I think that's great advice. I think that's where we need to get our health promotion and wellness industry. So thank you for that. So where can people find out more about you both and the study and the scale? Don't, don't, so they can, at once. <laughs> yeah, so where they can, <laughs> well, where should they, uh, I can link everything up in the show notes, but just in case they would like to hear where they could access the scale or learn more. So if they type in their search finder, Stanford Well for Life, it will come up. Um, and our website has a lot of information about the study. So the different faculty who are involved at Stanford, we have a great advisory board of international experts in various fields. Um, it talks about our well team. And then there's a link to our portal. And there's all sorts of resources and interesting information that's on our website. So it's at Stanford Well for Life. Got it. Well, I will link up the website in the show notes. And Sandy and Julia, thank you so much for your time today. You're welcome. Yes, thank Thanks you. For talking to us. If you want to make a greater impact on your organization's well-being and influence decision makers to step into the next generation of wellness, join me and my colleague, Rebecca Johnson, for our new training, Next Generation Wellness from Theory to Practice, starting in September. To get on the priority notification list, go to redesigningwellness.com forward slash impact and influence. We hope to see you there.